Welcome to the next section, Docker Swarm and Kubernetes, Clustering Infrastructure. Now, we move on to the first video of this section that deals with Docker Swarm. It is not okay anymore to just be a developer or a sys admin. Now, you need to be a full stack DevOps engineer in order to get success in any project. Full stack DevOps means that you need to understand the business and the technology used in the organization. Think about it. If you became a civil engineer instead of an IT engineer, it is mandatory to know the local rules plus the commercial names of the tools used to build roads and bridges, but also be able to coordinate their building. Maybe not every engineer needs to know everything, but they need to be aware of the full picture in order to ensure the success of the project. Coming back to containers and DevOps, making concepts simple for everyone to understand, is something that's mandatory nowadays. You want to ensure that all the engineers in your project are able to trace the software from conception to deployment. Also, have predictability in mind so that the business people that barely speak tech are able to plan strategies around the products that you build. One of the keys to achieving the flow described here is predictability. The way to achieve predictability is making uniform and repeatable use of your resources. Cloud data centers, such as Amazon Web Services or Google Cloud Platform, provide us with a virtually unlimited pool of resources that can be used to build our systems in a traditional way. It defines the size of the VMs, provision VMs, how to install the software and maintain it. Here are a few considerations. Clear separation between development and operations. This may vary depending on the size of your company. Software components owned by development and deployments and configuration owned by operations. Some servers might be relatively underutilized and on a very low load. This has been the picture for 40 odd years of software development and it is still the picture if we are running Docker containers. But there are a few problems. If a problem arises in component three in production, who is responsible for it? If there is a configuration mismatch, who will fix it if developers are not supposed to see what is going on in production? Server 1 is running a software component that might be called only once or twice a day. Do we need a full VM just for it? How do we scale our services in a transparent manner? These questions can be answered, but usually they get an answer too late in the game, plus the hidden requirements are only seen once the problems arise at the worst possible time, that is, service discovery, load balancing, self-healing infrastructure, and circuit breaking. During college years, one of the things in common across all the different subjects was reusability and extensibility. Your software should be extensible and reusable so that we can potentially build libraries of components creating the engineering sweet spot. This has been completely overlooked in the operations part of the software development until recent years. If you get a job as a Java developer in a company, there is a set of accepted practices that every single Java developer in the world knows and makes use of. So you can nearly hit the ground running without too many problems. Now let's raise a question. If all the Java apps follow the same practices and set of common patterns, why does every single company deploy them in a different way? A continuous delivery pipeline has the same requirements in pretty much every company in the IT world but I have seen at least three different ways of organizing it with a huge amount of custom magic happening that only one or two people within the company know of. Clusters are here to save us. Let's reshuffle the image. In this case, we've solved few of our problems. Now development and ops are connected via a middleware that is the cluster. Components can be replicated without provisioning extra hardware. DevOps engineers are the glue between the two teams, making things happen at a fast pace. The stability of the full system does not depend on a single server. As the cluster is built in a way that can accept some level of failure by just degrading performance or taking down the less critical services. It is okay to sacrifice emailing in order to keep the accounting processes of the company and about the hidden requirements. Well, this is where we need to make a decision about which clustering technology we want to use as they approach the service discovery, load balancing, and auto scaling from different angles. Now let's see Docker Swarm. Docker is a fantastic tool that follows the most modern architectural principles used for running applications packed as containers. 
In this case, Docker Swarm runs only Docker containers, ignoring other technologies at the moment. They are not suitable for production such as RKT. Even Docker is quite new to the scene, up to a point that some companies hesitate in deploying it in their production systems. There is not so much expertise in the market, as well as many doubts about security or how Docker works in general. Docker Swarm is the clustered version of Docker. All the Docker commands work in Docker Swarm so that we can federate our hardware without actually taking care of the hardware itself. Just add nodes to the pool of resources and Swarm will take care of them, leveraging the way we build our systems to purely containers. Docker Swarm is not something that we need to install aside from the Docker engine. It comes embedded into it and it is a mode rather than a server itself. Docker Swarm is evolving quite quickly and it is dragging Docker itself along as more and more features are being baked into it due to its usage in the Swarm mode. The most interesting part is how we can leverage our Docker knowledge into it without any extra knowledge as the Swarm mode of our Docker engine takes care of the resources. This is also a problem. We are limited by the Docker API, whereas with Kubernetes, we are not only limited by the Docker API, but we can also extend the Kubernetes API to add new objects to fulfill our needs. Docker Swarm can be operated through Docker Compose. It provides a decent approach to infrastructure as code, but is not very comprehensive when our application is somehow complex. In the current IT market, Kubernetes seems to be the clear winner of the orchestration battle, and as such, we're going to focus on it. But if you want to learn more about Docker Swarm, the official documentation can be found at this link.